So good evening. When, um, when Josh mentioned that uh, he had the world famous Native American flute player coming and I said, are Carlos Nakai? And he said, yeah. And I said, whoa. <laughs> and you know, I've been listening to his music for well over 30 years. I was lucky that one of my first teachers um, was of the native community and, and really his music touched me. And I told him that earlier in conversation that when you hear it, it speaks to you. And I am so honored and privileged to meet, I guess, an idol. Someone who has touched the hearts of many, obviously, tonight. You can tell by the audience that has gathered. And I am um, beyond privileged to be here. And I thank you all for coming. Tonight, we have, um, we have two performances that are going to happen. The um, Young Blood Shinnecock singers are here. And speaking of which, there they are. I told him to give me a minute or two. So we were talking backstage. I think that mic over there might be hot. Or actually, let me come up here. I'll just come up here and we'll keep it. We'll keep it, you and I, talking like this. Good evening, folks. And in my language, I'd like to say, Akwe. Way so on Charles, not to teach you on cause, which I should not go okay. And that means my name is Charles Cause, it's a name I was given by my mother, and I come from the Shinnecock Nation. And on behalf of the Young Blood Singers, I'd like to say thank you for having us tonight, and it is an amazing honor to be able to open for our Carlos Nakai. So, just really quick, I want the guys to go around and just introduce themselves because it. These guys are amazing. How y'all doing? I'm Lancelot Alfred Gums III from the Shinnecock Nation tribe. My spiritual name is Kawhi, one who speaks loud, gifted to me by Sachem in the beautiful year 1998. Akwe, my name is Justin Maddox. I come from the Eastern Pequot Tribal Nation in Connecticut. Uh, I live over here now with my brothers and I sing with my brothers now. Uh, my spiritual name is Shogun, which means blackbird and it was gifted to me by my mother. A queen, what a kissing. Newtimus Nades Weiss Williams, hello, my name is Newtimus Williams. Newtimus in our culture means oak tree, so my name is oak tree. A <laughs> uh, my name is Deshaun. I'm from the Shinnecock Indian Reservation. Uh, my spiritual name is Patakis, which means gray wolf. A And how could I forget mine? The spiritual name in which I was blessed with is Nikita Hane, and that is the embodiment of all the celestial waters that make up this earth. And I appreciate you guys again. Thank you so much. I'll be back.
Good job. And so that was just our opening song. We got a little more for you. Um, I just wanted to explain the quick differences between the songs you may hear tonight. Um, majority of them are going to be straight, which means it's going to be a lot of way ya hey ya <laughs> in a very creative, melodical way. And uh, some of our songs have actual words from our language and various other languages across the nation, such as the Lakota language, um, and as well as our home natural language, which is the Algonquin language. Thank you. So now this last song that we're going to sing for you is called Walela, and that means beautiful woman. And the church. And Cherokee.
And with that being said, this was our set for the time being. We are the Young Blood Singers of the Shinnecock Nation. We appreciate your time tonight, folks. Clap it up for yourselves for being such an amazing audience. And please get ready for the sweet, soothing sounds of our Carlos Nakai. There's always that moment of like, what is dead air? And how long is that gonna last? Especially when it's like broadcast TV stuff, right? Um, once again, I am just beyond moved when I hear, when I hear what I've heard, it hits me. It makes me feel deep inside myself. The drum is the heartbeat, right? And we feel that, you feel that, and you feel their voices, and they lift us, and it resonates. Tonight I have the privilege of introducing our Carlos Nakai to the stage. This man is truly amazing. I mean, just amazing. Uh, hum humble and, um, and a teacher, for sure. So, I'm going to quit talking so he can start his performance tonight. Please welcome to the stage our Carlos Nakai.
Thank you. Why well, took off on another program altogether? <laughs> it's good to be here. I haven't been here for quite a while. I was in another community nearby and did a show, but at that time I was all decked out in what they call traditional clothing. Um, but in actuality, traditional clothing is what I have on now and what we're all wearing, of course. I work with instruments that came by acquisition from Central and Northern European peoples. I was of the understanding that they may have become Native Americans themselves, but in actuality, they were only here to finish inventing a new kind of synthesizer that began in the 16, 1700s. And in order to do so, they had to find a place where they could get old growth wood because they had used much of it up <clears throat> in building warships in Europe. And so they came to the Northeast. North and maybe a little bit west of this community of all of you Native Americans today and the Native tribes who still live here today too. They found the old growth wood and they began making the flu pipes for the first synthesizers. And I say that because the awareness came to me the other day that in actuality, these people and the bodgers they brought with them were crafting with their handmade lathes and everything, the flu pipes that would belong to that synthesizer, but there were more than 200 of them, flu pipes of the pipe organ. And what they wanted to do with it was they wanted to make music louder. That's all. <laughs> and today, of course, we have people who play synthesizers, the same thing as the recorder with a bunch of pipes on it. But in this case, it's mostly electronic because of the innovation, of course, of the Chinese and other cultures who found electronics works this way too. And many of the indigenous tribes that the Haudenosaunee people came across said, you know, these guys came from Europe and they left behind these little whistles. <laughs> and they made, they showed us how to make finger holes in them. And of course the early ones only had four and they took the languid, as they called it, and they shaved it down and put a little air director mechanism on it so that it would hit an edge, just like on these things that you see when they travel around, um, either as calliopes or if you're lucky enough to go to a Christian church, you'll hear these instruments playing. And so they left these behind and we would like to gift your tribe one of these. And so you have many of the old flute pipe flutes now <clears throat> being performed on and decorated in many ways by indigenous tribes so that you could identify easily whom the maker is, was, could be, and the patterns that they put the instruments together in, but they were mostly hand carved. So they were arbitrarily tuned 
not like the flue pipes of the pipe organ. They figured, well, you have to learn how to play it. <laughs> um, and our, the tribes that we gathered them from, they sing a particular kind of, you know, chanting form, you know. Yeah, <laughs> We learn some of those songs, but we have songs in our own tribal communities too, and we found ways to play them. So I began <clears throat> this presentation with one that belonged to the last of the traditional flute players from the old culture. And he passed about seven years ago in Oklahoma. His name was Doc Tate Nevaquoya. And his nephew before him, Tom Mochatiwer, was a Kiowa flute players, player, and they worked together quite a bit to try to retain and recover the vocal music of the community in such a way that it could be played on the flute. He came to visit me in Phoenix, Arizona, and he said, I've been listening to what you're doing with these instruments. Where did you learn to do that? I said, I don't know. It just came one day. I said, I'm, I'm a brass musician. And I was trained at Arizona State College in Flagstaff, Arizona. And then I was drafted and I studied the rest of my music discipline um, at whatever station I was sent to. And so I picked up some in San Diego, some in Long Beach, some in Seal Beach, some over in Hawaii, some here and there. And even on the ships that I was stationed on, I said there were musicians there too, and I would go and study a little bit with them and say, this is how this Western European discipline works. And I said, wow, okay. I came home after I had damaged my embouchure and I said, oh, I can't play anymore. I've got to find a way to continue my music studies. And unfortunately, I couldn't continue on the piano either because, uh, you know, in the service, you, they don't have pianos. <laughs> and if you're not a musician, you can't touch that. You have to be... A, a musician that was trained with the military in order to play this instrument. You know, you know, there are rock and roll musicians in town. They play piano pretty well. Well, you go ask them. Well, you know how it is. They don't, they, at that time, well, I was in the military during the Vietnam conflict, and they said, no, we can't let you do that. He said, you're in the service. You're, you're a military person. We don't work with them. So I go, oh, okay. I came home. I found a, what they call a wall hanger. And um, was curious about how they worked. And I took one apart, figured out the sound producing mechanism, and <clears throat> studied in the Smithsonian Magazine an article. And I said, wait a minute. That looks just like one of these instruments, and it's a flue pipe. The technology of the pipe organ, and that was it. Bingo, the light bulb came on. And um, I've been doing that ever since.
Oh. C major. Actually, A minor. It's a relative minor key. Of A major scale, all seven of them. And this is its relative minor scale. And now I have a discipline in hand. And I've had these tuned by four flute makers that I work with and have worked with because one of them passed recently. I worked out a discipline of my own based on <clears throat> now the major and minor scales of the Western European discipline of music. And I also have learned the language of music in the Western European discipline, of course. <clears throat> so I have the language written down, just like I learned American going to school. And <clears throat> I can put down most of the melodies that I would like to play. Um, but that's nice. Because I grew up also from what they call elementary school and then junior high school and then high school and then the university system of playing brass, but only what I could read on paper. So in that way, it's limited because as a classical musician, I cannot just play. I'm supposed to be able to read what's on paper. And I go, wait a minute. Not everything's on paper, you know. <laughs> there are cultures all over the planet who just play. Children do it as a matter of course. <laughs> ah. There's no written notation for child play. It's natural. And I said, wait, wait a minute. I met a number of people in a, in a small town northwest of here called West Hurley, New York. And um, I was sent there by my spouse. You need to go to this school. It's going to last for three weeks. And it's taught by musicians who were trained at Juilliard. I said, oh, yeah, I know Juilliard. It's a new place. He says, yeah, but it's all mainly, you know, you learn how to read music. I said, yeah. But she said, this one, they teach you a process called improvisation. And I said, you know, I was told at the university you'd never fake music. <laughs> and she said, yeah, well, that's what Carl Berger was saying in his article, too. We're going to show you how to fake music. <laughs> well, I got there and I realized all the musicians who were there were also fully trained from the piano where all musicians begin their music training and their knowledge of music, you've got to be able to play the piano all the way up to whatever instrument in the world you would like to play, including handmade instruments. Oh my God, light bulbs came on all over the place. I spent the time with a jazz musician in the same room and he taught me a whole lot of things about improvisation. And he says, don't bother reading stuff because you're limited to what you can play. Learn how to really play your instruments. And I learned that from other musicians too. A band called Kadona, who are no longer here, and percussionists and an African percussionist who said, all music's 
especially jazz, started in Africa. He says, because we originated rhythm and we originated choruses of percussion. And so when I met Baba Tunde later, he goes, you come up here to this stage and you play with us and here's your drum. It's a bata drum. I said, my God, what am I supposed to do? You improvise, remember? <laughs> so I improvised and it was fun. But even before that time, I was taking these instruments and figuring out the sounds and the patterns of sound that they do. And I found that improvisation is the hardest thing in the world to do because you have to think all the time and you have to listen. And there's no paper. It's right here in my mind. And it's so much fun now that when I met with my, another friend of mine named Paul Horn, he said, you know, I made this album and it's called Inside the Taj Mahal. Well, I traveled to India and I looked at this wedding gift of this man that he built for his wife, new wife. And he says, but God, the echoes were wonderful in there. Only problem is you can't record them, which I discovered <clears throat> trying to record natural echoes in Canyon de Chez in northern Arizona and in little hidden coves in the Grand Canyon and hidden coves in southern Colorado <clears throat> and in the chapels in Chart in France. And I said, oh, I love this stone temple, but I like the echoes coming back. They can't be recorded. He says, but I found an instrument and it does this. Wonderful little instrument now, the Roland 2000, <laughs> the very first digital delay instrument that you can use on stage and you don't have to stand there and program it endlessly because it remembers stuff and you just press number 12. <laughs> and it's, it gives you the d delay you want. 
I remember being in Canyon de Chelly years ago, and I wondered what the Anasazi were listening to when that whistle player was out there doing their thing. And so let me give you an image. Maybe this is what they were doing, and then I'll set up the instrument, press number 12, <laughs> and play. So with the Chinese invention of electronics and taking it five or six or 10 more steps into the future, I ran down to the music store in Phoenix and said, I want a Roland 2000. Why we have one here? And it costs this much. I said, I'll take it. I don't care how expensive it is. I need it. So like I did here, I play now the canyons of all the different temples that I've been to. And even in the highlands of Scotland, in order to earn my scotch, I have to play music. <laughs> so I'll take my little effects unit and my suitcase and run over there, play music, make the old ladies in the front row cry. You've earned some scotch. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's so good to be here this evening with all of you. Just thank you. And I love looking at the Scapa flow out there and playing this music. Oh, my God. I'm going to play some more for you. You know, because you can't only have one small glass of scotch. You know, and you have to be like the Highlanders, so you get very spiritual, you know. <laughs> so I do that now. Oh, and this was in C minor. Huh? And it has that low quality because a flute maker invented that pitch, that low pitch. There were never any that small in the old days. We were all different. Here's one in D minor that I want to do for you now. Dreaming, dreaming, dreaming.
I'm not ignoring all of you on this side, but my stage was set up this way. So I have to kind of, you know, spend my time looking, trying to look right, left, stage left. Working with these instruments and moving away from the romantic cultural community was kind of a difficult thing to do. And so much of what I've been doing since that time for the past 45 years is figuring out what these things are capable of doing. I've worked with symphony orchestras now, playing only these instruments. I determined I would make these instruments an important component of my life and my lifestyle and my work, working with instruments that were acquired from another culture and brought into the world of the indigenous tribes here in North America. And being innovated in a, in a manner that they played somewhere in different keys, but I decided I would apply the Western European discipline and I would find a way to get these tuned to A435, which is the natural tuning of, you know, the world. And um, it works. And if I want to play American music or American music, <laughs> then I can blow a little harder and play at A440, which is total totally unnatural, you know, range to play at. And then I realized too that Europeans say A440 doesn't work. It's too sharp and it's a kind of music temperament that doesn't allow you to relax and really hear the music. And I go, hmm, okay. And I discovered that in Hamburg too because I got up on stage with them. I had all the electronics, of course, and um, I started playing. They said, you're out of tune. <laughs> oh my. I said, okay, I have to play softer, but now I have to use the electronics. Well, after all the rehearsing that afternoon, we got to the stage all together. They introduced me, I came out. There's no sound system. Mr. Nakai, we do not play with sound systems. Here's the orchestra. We invented the orchestra. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> and this house is lined in linen and cotton and wool. And it's perfect. I said, yes, I know that. That's why they didn't bomb it in World War II. <laughs> you know, because it's, it, you know, it's a historical monument to music, one of many. And I said, well, I'll go ahead and play. Well, they kind of heard me in the audience. Oh, his fingers are moving. The orchestra is going to town, you know. So there are some, you know, little divides that I have to conquer every once in a while. But a lot of it does with what we understand of music and what it should be. And even in the modern world, I'm very grateful for those Northern Central Europeans who came here, those flute pipe makers to make this instrument available to me through the culture of the Mohawk tribe. And they spread it to the woodlands, they spread it to the plains. And so many of the plains people today use this instrument. They regard it as being sacred and it is because music is the most powerful medicine that can ever be, you know, 
it, it will heal, it will change one's understanding of how to be in the world. It, it will do all kinds of things. And as you all know, of course, you know, um, everyone can do music. And I always get arguments. No, I, I grew up, I never did music in my life. And I said, don't lie to me. <laughs> you know, you've been doing music all your lives. I said, in fact, you came into the world singing. No, no, that's not true. I said, yes, it is. Hmm? Child's tune. Some of you may know this song. You know, of course, it's in the key of E minor. Where am I? And who are these ugly things looking at me? I just came through this little doorway and now... It's what is this place? So we were all born singing, you know. We are all natural musicians. So child's tune I do once in a while, but it turns into something beautiful too on its own. which my percussionists were here with me. <clears throat> and we would be a duet of udu and flutes. So it's expanded a little bit, you know, working with other musicians and um, finding a way to 
<clears throat> make this instrument work not as a solo instrument only, but also as a component in either duet or trio. I work with chamber ensembles now, and I really love it because I love the sound of the of the um, <clears throat> viola, and I love the sound working with the cello and viola and a native flute working on top of it. And again, it's all, okay, what key are we in? Oh, let me see. Um, yeah, I like the sound of A minor. It's very easy. It's the key of C major. Anyone can do music in C major. You know, it's all the white keys. So, and with, you know, the cello and the viola, of course, they're in their own keys, too. And so it all works out. And you start. The cello takes off. And usually they do long tones. I said, don't just do long tones. That's really boring. Give me some pizzicato of something or other, you know. And play towards the bridge so it has a different tonality altogether. Yeah. Uh, we normally don't do that. I said, yeah, you make cello sound boring. So let's make it interesting. Yeah. And we do that. And we have a good time mesmerizing people. So anyway, that's what I do with these instruments. And um, when I was asked to come here and do this, I thought, what am I going to do? And I said, I hope they don't ask for, and dress in a traditional style. I said, oh, I can do that. Yeah. All my traditional clothing on, living in the 21st century. So, but what about the music? Yeah. Well, I'll do two or three traditional songs, and then that'll be it. And then the rest, I'll work on the improvisations, and I'll do that and talk a little bit about what I do in the world today as a flute player and a member of a cultural community that, of course, shares its information with others. And I always wonder, With the Native American people and being an anthropologist and studying cultures, they came from the planet. All Americans came from the planet. And they ended up in this small nation But they didn't come here of choice. They were relegated to this new awareness because wrong religion, wrong philosophy, um, wrong understanding of how to be in the world. So they said, we don't need you here. Our culture is very much on its own road and we would like for you to get on this boat and go to America. And maybe the Indians will eat you. <laughs> yeah, we don't eat human beings. And we certainly don't eat bears because they're related to us too. And we persist as we do as a matter of course, I think, when I come to the city, which we know which one it is, New York, a mishmash of cultures. And they've taken the African music and turned it into something called jazz. And it builds on the instrumentation that other cultures brought here. 
And then we have rock and roll, the most sacred music of America, because it incorporates all the musics of all the cultures who were thrown away to this small country. You can hear all the hymns, you can hear all this sacred communications that were done by many of the cultures that are here today, and even the languages that we use. Merkin, of course, when I go to England, they won't understand what I'm saying. You Americans, you should learn English. <laughs> well, we say we're learning that, at, you know, where I, when I went to school. But yes, we have our language, which is based on all the cultures who came here. So our language is very different and it's significant. Yes, I do not speak English. I speak American. <laughs> you people are uncivilized. No, we're not. Every culture on the planet is in my small country called the United States of America. I said, and we do our music. And you English people would like to have it too. I said, some Americans think the Beatles are great. I said, but you know, we have our own great musicians. You should come to New York City and listen to what we do today. It's a mishmash of every cultural music on the planet. It's very sacred to us. And the rock and roll. And we even dance and hop around. I said, it's fun music. Have a good time music. So now we need 52 weeks of culture so some of us can have 12 outfits in a closet dedicated to I am this. Oh, and next week I am this. Oh, and next week I am this. So you I'd begin to identify how you are as a multicultural person. I think that would be even more fun because we can see ourselves in the guise of being a world person, you know. We tried that in the 60s. And we were going to buy an island somewhere out in the Pacific or maybe the Atlantic. But most of the Californians said, no, that ocean is too rough. <laughs> and the sand isn't, it doesn't feel good. It's too rocky. So let's try the Pacific. And we were going to buy an island off Hawaii. And they invented a flag, you know. In fact, in the 60s, we invented this rainbow flag, you know. And then we had a green chicken foot, you know, that we wore, a peace symbol. And we were going to go and be separate. Well, we didn't even know that we are living in it now. We already have a world culture here. We are the world. And we have a language that's so off the wall. I said, the people don't understand what we're saying in other parts of the planet. And they all want to er learn our language. This morning, I had some people from South America who were learning to speak American, you know. And so they were inquiring of us different things, and we would respond in the American language. And there we go, oh, okay, thank you. I said, what for? I said, there you go, because I'm learning your language. And to be able to speak to you people in your way, is, it's really good. I said, yeah, we are very powerful, you know. but we don't act like it. We just have a good time. So <clears throat> in that in mind, you know, I hope I imparted some awareness and knowledge of things, but native culture, we change too. We live in the 21st century too. And I wear the traditional clothing that comes from Sri Lanka <laughs> <laughs> and the shirt from China, you know, and handmade material made in Colorado by a native designer 
who found this material that kind of originated somewhere in Denmark. That looks native. He said, oh, no, no, that's a traditional design, but I made it look native. <laughs> oh, okay. So think about it. And don't forget to vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> that was kind of a joke. <laughs> so anyway. I knew it. Okay. So we're going to have a discussion here. And I was hoping I could get people out here to say, are you really crazy or what? <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Hello. So, uh, the, the um, you know, Josh, the producer tonight, the creative director here, he tells me, he goes, so, um, they're, they're kind of in a time crunch. And I said, but Josh, he's teaching. And he said, yeah, but they have dinner. And I said, well, we'll do what we can. And if, if it's OK with you, here, I'll give you this one. Yeah, I think you're on. Hello? Yeah, we got this one? Just have it on. Yeah. It works. OK. OK. You can hear me anyway. I think you turned it off. One, two. Okay, I got this one. Can you make that one work? There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Bop, bop. Bop, bop, bop. You know, just, just really quick, I wanted to touch on one of the things that you were talking about when you, when, when you were talking about the science behind the music. You're talking about a vibration, right? There's a certain tones that hit the body with both stringed instruments and, and wood wind instruments. It's that vibration that we connect with that I think really brings your music to this, to this earthly place. It makes you feel, or like, it makes me feel grounded most of the time. And sometimes I soar like an eagle in my own mind when listening. But can you talk more about the, how, how does it make you feel when you're playing? Do you feel like you're, the, is it you're composing as you're going along or is it just, is it just, the music moving through you. Yeah. Um, in through composition or in music, yes. Um, in much of the music that I do, um, the improvisation requires a sensibility of what we call through composition. In other words, for me, all the rules and things go past here in my mind as if, you know, I'm always thinking about where do I intend to go next? Um, they call it through composition. It's very important because even in the discipline of music, playing in symphonies or ensembles of one kind or another, you have to listen to what the other is, is doing at the moment and then match pitches and tonalities with each other. There are no soloists in improvisation. Everyone works together. So it's sort of a group concept of performing and making people feel good. The other two is that in all of that, there are musicologists who've studied music and its effect on people. <clears throat> and they find like when you chant, as an individual, let's say you're meditating, um, you are working with the very basic understanding of what music is or what sound, the quality of sound is. And it's indicated with a very simple diagram called a sine wave pattern. That's all music is, nothing more. But you can vary that sine wave pattern, the amplitude both ways, closer together or louder. So it can go this way or it can go that way 
you know, and it all comes together. And when people match their sine wave patterns in music, especially since I work there, is you're bringing together that diversity of, of melodic quality of sound in a way by what they call composition. You put these sine wave patterns together in such a way, and then when you play them, the amplitude and the speed of the sound you're producing, it all works together and it sounds either pleasing or raucous at the moment. So all of that together, and you're sitting, and we were discussing earlier, um, how do you meditate? Well, there's one way. Or there's another of doing an intonation of one kind or another. But what's it reaching to? Self. <clears throat> you are listening to what your body is doing and how it's vibrating and it's going in here. The intention is for it to awaken what is inside of this plasma bag that we inhabit. <laughs> See? That's how children heal themselves. <clears throat> you know, you'll find a young person, you don't have to give them drugs or medicines, as they call them, pharmaceuticals. Listen to what they're doing. I don't feel good today, I'm gonna go lay down. Or I wanna go outside. And you'll find them somewhere just, yeah, uh, yeah. What are they doing? They're making a sound that they know is reaching into them. And it vibrates the different areas of the organs that inhabit this bag. And they know that as a matter of course. Every young person, you know, let's say before the age of, of learning the rules, knows how to heal themselves. And it's very easy to do. You don't need pharmaceuticals. I have friends today who've had cancers. And the way you heal yourself that way, and even natives will tell you, you chant to yourself. You don't do it out loud. You just, there's a sound. And when you feel the quality of that sound, it will go into you. You want to heal yourself. You want to make yourself feel good. And so that quality is something that is very natural to us. But the problem is we forget it. When we come through the doorway, you know, before we arrive in this present physical reality in this dimension, we write this note, I'm going to do this when I come there. You fold it up, put it in your back pocket. You come out and immediately somebody says, don't do that. Do what everyone else tells you. And you go, wait a minute, I have a note somewhere. Oh my God, I forgot where I put it. But you know already how to keep yourself well. You don't need somebody who, they say, I practice being a physician. And I love this one. So when will you become one? <laughs> what do you mean? You say, well, you said you're, you're having a practice of becoming or being a music, uh, physician. So when will you learn and finally say, I am? Get out of my office. <laughs> I think we should open it up to at least two questions, and then we'll wrap this evening up because we have to. You know, I want to see. I want to see what they're. What, okay. You, I, I told you we were going to do our best to mess this up. So, <laughs> Josh, yeah. do you have somebody out there?
Could you please tell us how they're tuned? Physically, how are your flutes tuned? You spoke about owning them and then taking them to somebody who tuned them for you. How did they do that? It's the way that they're made. Um, <clears throat> two of my flute makers um, have diagrams and mathematical um, dimensions of how to carve the wood, how to make the bore diameter work, how to make the length of the tube work, how to make you know all the different sound producing components of the instrument, it, including placing the finger holes in a certain manner and um, in a certain um, diameter, all relative to each other. And, and they keep those, those charts in a, in a three ring binder, which they don't share with anyone. I mean, I've even tried, I, I play, can you show me how you made this? I said, yeah, I can do that, but I'm not going to give you that information. Um, for them, it's a spiritual process. Because again, we get back to, they know how to manipulate that sine wave pattern in the tonality of these instruments. They sound higher or lower. You know, and, and they know that, I think. But they haven't been, you know, they are not Buddhists. They are not um, people who go to the spiritual practices and, and share that with others. They keep it to themselves. And I think they're on their own spiritual journey too because they'll create an instrument that other people will like. And there's a, a specific tonality they work with. So not all flute makers uh, make the same instrument. And I tell people, where can I get one? Uh, First, you pitch what you vibrate at. You find out what your physical vibration is of all the organs in your body moving. You turn out a pitch too. Now, you go down and you find a shop or you find a, a market somewhere and they say, can I try this flute or that flute? Or if you know the pitch you're vibrating at, um, do you have any in B minor? Mm, um, I think I do. You want it high or lower sounding? I don't know. Let me try it. <clears throat> and you could do an investigation like that, and all of a sudden, a flute will sound the way you like for it to sound, and that's how you do it. And so those flute makers know the same thing and they will say, try these instruments and find the one that sounds like you. And that's how music works. Um, the early masters, great masters, composing those pieces that we still listen to today, we like them because they pitched the piano compositions according to what they sound like. So you hear Beethoven, Mozart, Sansons, anyone, you know, Bach, you know, the music is pitched according to this, the way I want it to sound. And it's all in here. There's nothing out there. Josh, there is somebody over on this side. No, they answered the question. Oh, we're okay. All right. Oh, sorry. Got him up front. Okay. All right. I'm just curious. You said that you began your musical education uh, playing other wind instruments. Are you by any chance like a, a closet trumpet player also? I still play trumpet, uh -huh. but I use this end blown block flute. A lot of my technique is, is brass technique. Uh huh. I double, double tongue, I triple tongue. When I go to the National Flute Association conventions, they ask me, how do you do that quaver? How do you do that? And I uh, go, oh, it's trumpet technique. I see. Yeah, so I'm a closet trumpeter still. <laughs> Thank you for this spectacular evening. Thank you. So.
Any final thought that you'd like to leave us with before we, we say good night? Yeah, I think some may have come just for the sound of the instrument, but you know, I do all of this other um, information too, because it's good to impart, there is no secret about music. Everyone knows it. You don't have to play an instrument, you sing, sing. <laughs> You're driving and it's rush hour. <laughs> You know, um, but in all times, especially as a traditionalist, we always impart to people something of importance to an individual. Say this with me. I am, I am. the most important person, the most important person. In my, world. in my world. You are the center of all existence, each one of us. But the center is not outside of you, somewhere in the ozone. It, is, it flows right through you down to the center of where you stand, of where you sit, of where you are at the moment. And it changes on occasion, but you are always the center of all life. We regard in all of my traditional manners, including sitting there and singing the Chod with other Buddhists, we are aware of the fact that in doing all of this together, we are sharing the energy of our existence with all those around us. And you do the same thing. So when you feel left out and all alone in the world, you get your shower in the morning or in the evening and you stand before a mirror with nothing on, no armor. This is armor. It keeps others from knowing you. I am the most important person in my world because you are the only one who sees everything that surrounds you in the manner that you do. You are quite important. The other is we always say, whatever place on your road of life you happen to be on at this moment or another moment in your time, may it be one that is surrounded in beauty and harmony and peace. And may you also walk your own road with a cool body. In other words, you acknowledge yourself and your own self-awareness about being in the world. And I feel good. I feel good about being me. Always think that way. Always be that way. Always feel that way. And it's very difficult to do. But once you obtain the methodology to do this with yourself, then you will have a good time. And that's what I always say. After all of this event, wherever you happen to be headed to, and even in your work, make sure you have a good time. Because you only get this one chance. Thank you very much. Thank you truly for being here. It has been an honor to, to sit and talk to you. And yeah. I wish we had more time to talk more. Yeah, I know. Thank you, Jason. Thank, Thank you, you, R. Carlos Nakai. Thank you, audience, for coming. Thank you, Suffolk County Legislator Ann Welker. Thank you for the omnibus grant that made this possible. Thank you, and come back. See you soon.